Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming out on this rainy day. I know that rain in California deters people from all kinds of things, including going to class. Oh, it was raining. I couldn't. <laughs> I'm sorry. I would have gotten wet. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you for coming out. I'm Sue Castanetto. I'm the director of the Intercollegiate Feminist Center for Teaching, Research, and Engagement, uh, which is just over in Vita Nova Hall on the Scripps campus. Um, and I'm delighted to be here to introduce our exciting speaker for today, Koa Beck. Um, nice to meet you, Koa. Um, so I thought I would just say a little bit about how this, this event came to be. Um, her, her visit is sponsored by the Scripps Public Events and Community Programs. Um, and it was initiated by two Scripps students, Scripps juniors, um, Casey Malone, who's over here, um, and Casey is the co-founder of the Body Activism Club, a new club at Scripps, which challenges the primarily white cisgendered body positive movement and aims to change campus culture around food and eating disorders. And Casey organized this along with Corey Solorio Loduca, who's sitting next to Casey, who's representing Scripps College's Denison Library and is promoting two archival collections that Denison processed last year. One is the Second Wave Feminist Papers, and the other is the Joss Green Papers. And Joss Green um, graduated from Scripps, we think, in 2012. Um, Joss was, is amazing um, and is a trans man. Um, Corey notes that um, Koa's book, White Feminism, from the suffragists to influencers and who they leave behind, long title, I'll, I'll just say that full title once. Um, it's heavily informed by archival research that Coa performed in 2019 while she was a Shorenstein Fellow at Harvard. Um, and the book analyzes the role of historically women's spaces and their trans exclusion, um, which is of particular interest to Scripps right now as some Scripps students um, are exploring changing Scripps label as the women's college. Um, and then Casey and Corey will moderate a discussion following the talk. Yay, Casey and Corey. Um, and thank you for initiating this event. Um, also, just want to mention, you probably noticed, but there are book sales after the talk and discussion as well. So um, I have to admit, I have only read a small part of the book, but it's what, I, what I've read so far I love. I love your style, Koa, of blending the personal with the political, with the historical. Um, it's, I wish more academic feminists wrote like that. It's just a total pleasure to read. Um, so in doing a little bit of research, I just read endless praise about this book. So I thought that rather than me just talking about the book, since I haven't really read it, I would just read you a couple of examples, a couple from many, many, many examples of the praise that this book has gotten. Um, here's one from Kimberly Drew. White feminism is a must read for anyone ready to challenge just about everything they thought they knew about contemporary feminist discourse, which is all of us. Um, another one, don't judge this book by its cover. Koa Beck knows that feminism includes all women and girls by definition and is writing to overcome anti-feminist divisions that divide and defeat us. That's from Gloria Steinem. And here's one I liked from Mother Jones. Finally, here's a book that takes on white feminism in a smart, productive way, defining it, dismantling it, peeling back the you go girl layers to get to the white supremacy that powers it like a poison battery. Um, and I could go on and on, but I know that you want to hear Koa herself speak, so I, and you can read those praises online. Um, so here's a little bit about Koa. Um, Koa graduated from Mills College, which is also a su part subject of her book, which I enjoyed reading. <laughs> and I'm from the Bay Area. So. Um, and then, then after graduation, moved to New York and um, moved into editorial work. She served, and you may know this already, but she served as senior features editor at MarieClaire.com, executive editor at Vogue.com, and editor-in-chief at Jezebel. She also co-hosted the Me Too Memos a radio show on WNYC's The Takeaway, which you may have heard, wonderful show, um, co-hosted with Jessica Bennett, gender editor at the New York Times. And she also was the guest editor for a special pride section of the New York Times, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots with many illustrious writers. Um, 
she stepped down from Jezebel to write white feminism and also to work on her fiction. Um, she's a prolific writer and speaker, and her fiction and nonfiction pieces have appeared in all kinds of notable publications. Um, I, for the sake of time, I won't mention all of them, but um, she was named a Spring 2019 Fellow at the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, publishing the essay, Self-Optimization in the Face of Patriarchy, How Women's Media Facilitates White Feminism, which I'm, I'm sure you know firsthand very well, <laughs> lived experience. This year, she was awarded the Allen, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, Jutsi Fellowship at the Huntington Library right here in Pasadena for her research project, Valley Girl, the Suburban Stepdaughter of Los Angeles, which is the basis of her next book. Um, Koa has used her own positions, uh, her lived experience, and her writing, her voice, to push for a genuinely inclusive feminism. Um, for example, she described her work at Jezebel as aiming to, and I'm quoting from her, reframe women's issues under a spectrum of gender to account not only for women, but other marginalized genders as well, particularly non-binary identities. The book White Feminism offers not only a critical history and analysis of a particularly narrow kind of feminism that's dominated and shaped by privileged white women's and primarily for their own ends, what can I get while leaving everyone else out, um, but also it's a call for building a movement that is inclusive, that can exercise power, mobilize power to transform society and its institutions so that everyone benefits. Um, Combahee River Collective member, um, famous uh, black feminist activist, Barbara Smith, commented about this work. Beck challenges and inspires us to go beyond narrow, individualized notions of liberation to build genuine movements for justice, which we'll hear about today. So please join me in welcoming Koa Beck. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, it means a lot to me to be able to present this to you, particularly at Scripps, because um, as was just noted in the introduction, I'm a women's college graduate, and a lot of my formative education as an undergrad, um, what I was taught in terms of thinking critically about systems, about thinking critically about structures, challenging status quos, um, there is a direct through line, I'm absolutely sure, between the education I got at a women's institution and my ability to do this book. So it means a lot to me to come full, full circle and share it with you. So I think it's important in starting a discussion like this to begin particularly with how I define white feminism. Um, part of what incentivized me to write this book and to do the research is that when I was in newsrooms in women's media, this is like about, I would say, like 2016, 2017, around Women's March. White feminism started to be a word that I saw a lot in like internet discourse. But as far as I could glean as an editor and somebody who actively shaped online conversations and reporting, no two people seem to be operating from the same definition. Um, and I found that to be a deficit in actually understanding what white feminism is, but more importantly, how it operates and how insidious it is. So I'm gonna start with my definition. I'm sure you can find others. So I define white feminism as a very specific approach to achieving equality that can be advocated by anyone. Um, I cite many examples in my book of you know, very um, public-facing la Latinas who advocate uh, white feminist practices. Um, a number of you know, very famous women who are of a variety of identities, backgrounds, um, sexual orientations, who when they get up and talk about feminism, I would absolutely identify their platforms as white feminist in practice. Um, it pulls, white feminism pulls considerably from imperialism, capitalism, labor exploitation, and white supremacy. I'm gonna get into some more details about that later. Um, but many other movements that I use to contrast white feminism with, they are actively against these exact principles and they are foundational to their understandings of feminism and gender equality. Another um, cornerstone of white feminism that I found in my research was really consistent, whether we're talking about 2020 or 1920, is that white feminism consistently prioritizes and speaks to the individual as feminist. 
Um, I found this, especially as a writer and an editor, to be very tonally important in reading white feminist texts in that, for instance, a number of you know, black feminist texts, Chicana feminist texts, lesbian feminist texts, working class feminist texts, they speak to a collective, they speak to a we, they speak to a group, they speak to a body of, of people who are being disenfranchised. And yet white feminism is very consistent in its language and execution that when you are confronted with systemic oppression, you should turn inward. You should optimize yourself, you should think about yourself, you should think about your own family. Um, and many of these other movements that I'll get to in a bit, they look outward and they try and build bonds and coalitions with other people who are also being disenfranchised at work, who are being sexually harassed, who are being exploited for their labor. Lastly, um, another tenet of white feminism that I found to be really consistent across generations was that white feminism exports and advocates a very specific skill set to navigate patriarchy rather than dismantle it. So to give you an example, and I have many that are cited, um, white feminism has always been very big on sort of presenting patriarchy as this like almost video game. And if you can get enough education, if you can get enough skill sets, if you can get enough like hacks or cheating codes or outfits or um, you know different sort of people helping you out, you can succeed in patriarchy. But those exact barriers that you're jumping over, that you're trying to hack, that you're getting around, those don't change. And white feminism as an ideology and a practice has never been about changing those barriers. Contrastly, like I said for the other points, Black feminism, Chicana feminism, many working class feminisms, um, fat politics, absolutely, focus on those barriers and taking down those barriers rather than optimizing yourself to get over the barriers. And I'll also say that in conversations going forward about white feminism, I would encourage you to think about this particularly as an ideology and a practice. Um, something I find very disappointing as somebody who has written a book on this topic is in a lot of like online discourse, you know, people will fixate on an individual who clearly has white feminist practices and sort of fixate on them and terrorize them and I would argue like harass them as an individual. I don't really find that to be helpful here. Um, think about this not as like one, you know, particular white woman who's behaving badly on TikTok. Think of this as an ideology and a practice. It's so much bigger than her and anything, you know, she has ever put on Instagram. So, it's important, I think, in reorienting, you know, depending on your feminist literacy, I don't really know what your politics are, how you think about, um, you know, gender inequality. But I often start with these points um, to sort of gauge the room and also reframe a conversation for you. So between 2014 and 2019, this is some data that I saw in newsrooms, particularly in creating like women-centric reporting. These are um, data points I saw all the time as indicative of quote unquote feminist progress. Um, these were the data points that were reported in not just outlets I worked for, but like the New York Times, Washington Post, um, Mother Jones, a lot of different you know, affiliated, politically affiliated outlets to basically convey to you women are doing better in the United States. And this is where it focused. So between 2014 and 2019, women owned businesses grew 21% in the United States. 50% of these businesses were women of color owned. To be clear, black women owned most of these businesses that we're talking about. And most college graduates to date um, are women and have been for the last four decades. So again, this is the data that is presented as like women are doing better in the United States. Here's everybody else, okay? Black women narrowed the wage gap with white men in the United States by nine cents between 1980 and 2015. I'm 35, I was born in 1987. So to be clear, in my entire lifetime, black women have narrowed the wage gap by less than a dime in my entire life. Latinas have narrowed the wage gap even more narrowly in 35 years. They've closed it by just five cents, so less than black women. And between 1980 and 2017, the number of imprisoned women in the United States has grown 750%. And most of these women are mothers. 
So I think this is important data to show, essentially, for the slide before. Here are the white feminist talking points in terms of women are doing better. And these are all the women that are not accounted for when you encounter data like that. These are most women in the United States. The other slide that I showed you, those are the exceptions. Those are the women who go to colleges like Scripps. Those are the women that go to graduate school. Those are the women that are able to start businesses, get seed money, go to Silicon Valley. Um, that's not most women. So here are some classic hallmarks of white feminism that I have heard a lot in my career in life um, that I think would be helpful for you in terms of like gauging when white feminism is in the room with you. A enduring cornerstone I have found in a lot of research I've done about white feminism is that cis men are the template for equality. So something I heard a lot in different reports that I was running or different you know, pitches I was having, teams investigating, was the talking point of like, well, men run companies this way. So why should female CEOs be held to a different standard, right? So again, speaking to the fact that how cis men run things, how they are in the world, the way they exploit other people historically, um, the way that they abuse other people historically, that's the template for equality. Another enduring cornerstone of white feminism, and I found this to be very interesting during the suffrage era, is asking you to pay for feminism. Um, I have some more slides about this later showing you the exact artifacts, but um, when I was working in newsrooms, you know, kind of like circa Women's March, post-Trump, you know, remember all the like, nevertheless, she persisted sweatshirts and the feminist AF mug and all that stuff. Um, all that stuff was coming across my desk in just like a voracious manner. Um, and I naively thought that that was new. And it's not, it's actually a very old white feminist practice to take feminist credos and turn them into tote bags, mugs, apparels, keychains. Um, think of like, you know, very elite feminist branded conferences where you have to pay hundreds of dollars to get in a room and hear you know, other very elite women speak about gender equality. Um, exclusive clubs, I go into that in my book as well. Again, many other movements that are feminist identified that are not this ideology, you do not need to pay a certain amount of money to sit in a room and discuss uh, forming a union. You do not have to purchase a ticket to sit down and talk about being exploited in the workplace or how somebody sexually harassed you in a conference room. That is not the barrier for entry. And then the other enduring tenant that I found to be um, really enduring was white feminism asks us to aspire to whiteness and not equal rights. And what I mean when I say that is that you overcome patriarchy through business, through education, um, through any sort of like very class mobile ascension. So what you're actually aiming for is privilege. You're not aiming for barriers to be taken down so that other people can have access to the same sorts of resources that you have. You're asking within white feminism to be mistaken for you know, a very wealthy woman who has a corner office, even if that's not where you come from. Those are the aims of white feminism. So, uh, my book really begins, I think, historically and appropriately with the white middle to upper class suffragists in the United States. Um, I'm very particular with that terminology because there were suffragists in the United States who were black. There were suffragists in the United States who were native, um, but they did not advocate for this platform. It's worth noting. Um, white middle to upper class suffragists, I really see, particularly in my research and a lot of materials of, of theirs that I pulled and, and poured over and, and quoted from, um, they really envisioned equality for white women based on the power and autonomy of their husbands, sons, fathers, and brothers. And what I mean when I say that is that when these particular women were thinking critically about the vote, having the access to vote in the United States, much like an earlier slide, their template for equality was, well, my husband gets access to this. My son gets to be a certain age and he has access to this. My brother, who was raised in the same house that I was and has the same parents I did, when he got to a certain age, he got to go to this college. He got to participate in this sort of political sphere. And that's what they were aiming to procure with their platform. They envisioned um, obtaining the right to vote as a way to assume power and not necessarily equal rights. 
And I urge you in your um, assessments of gender equality, you know, whether it's in a classroom here at Scripps or out in the world after you graduate with your family, power and equal rights are not the same thing. And for white middle to upper class suffragists, they were absolutely merged as having power, having dominion over other people, exploiting other people, having a powerful business in which you don't pay people adequately and you do not give them health care and you do not give them bathroom breaks, um, being higher up in the domestic sphere so that you have an array of women of color doing everything in your home, including all your domestic labor, raising your children, that's equality. That's not equal rights. Um, this, uh, this particular cohort of women, like I just said, laid the groundwork for completing power and equality, and in a lot of their texts, it's very interesting to watch those words flip around um, as being interchangeable. Because again, I can't stress it enough, many other movements, including black suffragists, native suffragists, um, they did not have that viewpoint and that assessment. They wanted a more equal access to resources. They weren't necessarily looking to have power over anyone else. So these are some of the materials that I researched for my book. <laughs> um, it's worth noting that when this, again, this particular cohort of women got together and was trying to really galvanize the country to think critically about white women having the vote, they were very savvy in their understanding that you know, feminism, um, however they thought about it at the time, you know, a woman speaking publicly um, a woman who had political opinions that were not that of her husband, um, a woman who drew attention to herself in public and had opinions about what was happening in the world, those women were vilified in the press. I always say it's much like being a woman now on Twitter. So to that assessment, the, this particular group of women got out in front of sexual harassment, misogyny, um, a lot of assault, by basically deciding that before they went in front of this incredible violent misogyny, they would homogenize who a suffragist was. So they did a sort of, for lack of a better term, branding exercise with suffragists. So what's consistent across all these images and um, very consistent with much of the research I did for my book is that the suffragist is always a thin white woman who is middle class or aspiring to be. She's young, she's very conventionally attractive, and many other materials that I found, not only is she dressed you know, stylishly or glam glamorously, suggesting that she has disposable income. Many times, um, other images I found, she's like shielding a child, she's holding a baby. So these really homogenized images, when they were put in front of the country, the literal design of the white middle to upper class suffragists was, um, how can you hate us? We are pretty, we are white, we are thin, we are what you envision a woman to be. And it was a very keen exercise. A lot of these images literally were designed in-house by suffrage organizations. This wasn't marketing people. This wasn't um, you know, newspaper admin. These were suffragists who made these images in-house. And they exported them broadly to convey that they weren't challenging what a woman was. They were not trying to expand the definition of who a, a woman is. They were affirming it. And when you thought of women's rights in the United States, this is the type of woman you are supposed to think of. A key component of white feminism now and 100 years ago that I think is very critical to always um, keep in, in mind is that white feminism has never rethought labor in the United States. And again, I mean that as an ideology and a practice. I spent many hours poring over um, meeting minutes and sort of platform agendas and all kinds of materials around this time through what some people call the second wave and definitely now in uh, white feminist movements that I had to cover in my job. And the white feminist ideology advocates that women participate in these key three channels as cis men always have. So white feminism does not rethink domestic labor. So you know any of the low-income women, immigrant women, uh, women of color who work in homes, who are nannies, who are cleaners, who are caretakers, who take care of special needs relatives, who take care of elders, um, who make it undeniably possible 
for those particular women to leave their homes and go earn more money. Domestic labor is not rethought. Low wage labor is never reconsidered in white feminism. So like entry level positions, um, anyone who does any sort of like blue collar work, um, and also any exploitative labor. And exploitative labor can very much overlap with these other two. But what I mean is, you know, labor that is um, easily manipulated by power holders. So that could absolutely be, say, like a nanny, you know, who is new to this country and doesn't have a lot of sway in terms of a um, employer saying, well, we actually don't have to give you any sick leave. Um, if you do report any sort of abuses we have done to you, then we will facilitate you exiting this country. That sort of thing. So this is what I was talking about earlier in terms of the you know, various commercial elements. Um, white feminism of now and 100 years ago has always embraced commercialism. It's actually um, quite uninventive. <laughs> Um, I was really astounded when I found these in my research in that this votes for women flag is I think from circa 1921. This future is female mug is from 2020. And even though they're a little bit more modern, the messaging is still the same. Um, unlike many other movements for women and non-binary rights in the United States, um, white feminism has always been keen to partner with department stores and brands to explicitly sell the idea of suffrage. Um, if you go to any sort of, you know, like native women's movements in the United States about having access to clean water, they're not selling you tote bags. That's not a thing that they do. But white feminism is very clear that politics can be bought and particularly political identities can be bought. And that if you are a feminist and you do support women's rights, however you think about that politically, that identity can be purchased in a mug or a pin or a shirt um, I have a few on here, you know, the future is female, feminist AF, I'm sure you know them all by now. Another enduring tenet of white feminism is, again, now 100 years ago, white feminism often publicly aligns with famous and glamorous women. This is a, a pattern that I was very fascinated by, particularly since I come from women's media and I've been across a lot of profiles and had to you know, edit a lot of um, conversations with you know, like really gorgeous women in, in power suits talking about how lucky they are. <laughs> Um, this endures. So the woman on the left is Mary Pickford. Um, I go into a little detail about her in my book. She's a very fascinating person. Um, if you don't know anything about her, she is an actress, was an actress, producer, screenwriter, and a studio executive in the 20s. Um, she was known during her time for these really um, ringlet curls. That was like her trademark. And she is be considered, for lack of a better term, the pioneer for um, seeing a actress in the world and knowing her by name. It sounds really absurd to say now, but before Mary Pickford, people didn't know women actresses in the world. It's just like, oh, there's that girl who was in that thing. Mary Pickford really asserted herself as a brand and was one of the first women, if not the first, to have her name recognition be synonymous with her face. The fact that you can now see a picture of, say, Jennifer Lawrence and know, you know, off the top of your head what she wore at con or, you know, what she, I don't know, wore out with her partner or whatever, that's because of Mary Pickford. Um, Mary Pickford was a big supporter of women's rights. She was very into suffrage. Um, and she partnered with a lot of explicitly suffrage or organizations during her time. She posed for this photo right here with Votes for Women. Um, and she made a point of going to a lot of suffrage meetings, which um, suffrage organizations were very keen to have her because she was so beautiful, so glamorous. Um, she was truly the girl boss of her time, particularly given all her accolades. And so when she showed an interest in suffrage, white feminists were very keen to, much like those promotional materials I show you, say, look, this is who this is whose rights we're advocating for, this very beautiful, glamorous white woman who makes a lot of money and is very, very pretty to look at conventionally, specifically for cis men. So that's circa 1913. Over here on the right, you have these beautiful, gorgeous models. I'm sure you know them. 
Um, they, that is circa 2015 that photo was taken. Um, very similar exercise in terms of branding yourself uh, feminist through glamour, through beauty, through money, um, but also through visibility. Here are some very important white feminist practices that I go into a lot of detail on in my book, but I think are, are good for you to know in terms of, again, assessing white feminism being in the room with you. Again, these particular points are very unique to white feminism. I can't stress it enough. Other movements that I studied for my book that are for non-binary rights, two-spirit rights, uh, rights of women, they do not do these things. Uh, a key white feminist practice that I encountered a lot um, in a lot of coverage that I oversaw and edited was that white feminism asked that women and non-binary people aspire to be seen. What I mean when I say that is that if you are a single mother who is, say, Latina in this country, and you work in a call center, white feminism does not see you. But if you are said single mother who works in a call center and you want to start a newsletter, white feminism might see you. So the ideology does not meet them where they are. White feminism has never been invested in saying, you're a woman who works in a call center, your partner left you, you are tasked with raising two kids. What systemically needs to change so that you, said woman, can have equal access to affordable housing, to clean water, to food security, to health care? It asks that you aspire to be a different kind of woman to exist in white feminist movements and spaces. Another key practice is that white feminism doesn't challenge structural power. I've kind of been over this already. It encourages marginalized gender to excel in the present system. Um, I think about that a lot with a lot of content that I had to um, edit earlier in my career about you know, all, say, for um, corporate women, women who work in highly visible, you know, powerful roles, the um, misogyny that exists you know, even when they try to advocate for um, more equal wages to like their cis male partners um, when they need a certain amount of time off because they've given birth or have adopted a child. And yet the white feminist practice is often to get to the top of that system, to not necessarily change it for other people, whether that's for you, whether that's for the younger women who are coming up in the company, whether that's for the women on the cleaning staff who come in and clean those corner offices that you worked so hard to achieve. Um, again, white feminism encourages you to succeed in the video game. It does not think beyond the video game. Um, white feminism aligns feminist principles with profitability. I learned this a lot, um, sort of fly by the seat of my pants in newsrooms, where a lot of times when I would be trying to report on feminist progress or feminist movements, what would be put in front of me was a dollar sign. <laughs> So not basic need, right? So not this many women were able to achieve food security in the United States. This many women were able to secure health care for them and their families. That's not a marker of white feminism. Um, white feminism, and I have many examples of this in my book, aligns these principles with profitability, particularly for companies. So a stat I used to hear all the time on panels that I would sit in on was like, oh, you know, if you have like X number of women on a board of a company, your returns are likely to be this much higher. And that would be presented as feminism. Boggles the mind. Okay. Um, white feminism also asks that you, I got into this earlier, asks that you look inward rather than to those around you. So when confronted with many of the awful things that happen with being a marginalized gender in the United States, when you're confronted with pay inequity, when you're confronted with any sort of marginalization, when you're confronted with harassment, um, you are supposed to optimize yourself in white feminism. You are supposed to go to HR and advocate your own job performance. You're supposed to cite your own metrics, um, all the growth you have brought to the company. Um, you are not supposed to advocate for the other women in the company who are probably also being paid poorly as well. Um, if you have been violated within a space like that, statistically, I say this as somebody who has done the reporting, it's probably not just you. There have been other marginalized genders who have also been violated in that same space. And yet white feminism silos people. 
It asks them to only think about themselves and not build movements across any sort of marginalization or structural oppression. So this is what I would quantify as peak white feminism. Um, and because I'm from women's media, I saw this happen all the time left and right. It's a really common white feminist practice. Upholding one woman or non-binary person for achieving an anomalous status and making her them the quote unquote feminist standard that all marginalized genders must aspire to. So to give you an example, right, like let's say one particular lesbian identified woman got to the top of one particular company. She will now be upheld as the feminist standard. <laughs> Clearly everyone should aspire to be her. She has overcome all of these barriers and therefore you can too. It's a very quick freeway on ramp and not very realistic, especially when you mine a little further down into like, well, how was she able to get to the top of that company? Is she white? Is she from a middle class home? Is she a citizen? Um, is she femme passing? Do people mistake her for heterosexual when she walks into these spaces? Um, and this quote underneath, this is from my book, and when my book was published, this particular quote uh, really went viral on social media. I think a lot of people really either felt seen by it or it really spoke to them. But a good contrast to that that I, that I think is important to think about, quote, a domestic worker may, may never be a CEO and that shouldn't hinder her ability to live above the poverty line. And that is where white feminism falls apart in this um, insistence that you know every single woman can somehow become this powerful producer of money and autonomy when for many women in the United States and non-binary people we're talking about basic need we're not talking about luxury or having a lot of money or going to a lofty school so here are some threads that I found in my book that bind other feminist movements that are not white feminists in practice. And it's really incredible to see this in terms of so many movements that are feminist identified or advocate on behalf of marginalized genders. These are things that they have in common. And even though they come from such different places and the oppression is so different, um, they are able to think critically in, I would argue, a similar way. So indigenous, queer and trans, black, Latinx, working class, immigrant, disabled, Jewish, fat, these are all movements I go into in my book. Here are the things they have in common. Everyone having access to a resource. So like I said earlier, affordable housing, clean water, education, a living wage, food security, workplace protections. Something I've, I've been privy to a lot in my career is kind of much like the you know one woman that everyone aspires to be something that can happen within white feminism that is somewhat advocated, but I would also argue is somewhat unconscious, is that if there's one woman in a community who is able to get a flashy job or is able to have you know, a particular kind of asset or is able to secure herself in an economic way, in white feminism, the community goes, how do we all be like her? In many of these movements I cite here, it's not about everyone being like that one person who's made it, who's been able to support her children, who has a, a partner. Um, it's about everyone having access to a resource. And how can the gatekeepers around that resource change so that we can all have it and we don't all have to conform to this one person who has access? All these movements are also not trying to sell you anything. Um, like I said earlier, they're more concerned with basic need they aren't really here trying to give you tote bags and keychains and sweatshirts and asking you to sign up for this and pay money to join this exclusive club. Um, they're not really interested in products. Another key thing that they have in common is that they are all challenging power. Unlike white feminism, all these movements are disrupting hierarchies and envisioning a more equitable distribution of resources. And that is what they have in common. So here are some ways, and I have used these, <laughs> um, to control for white feminism in either your classrooms, um, or your jobs, or your family, or your social circles, or you know whatever sort of clubs you may work with, whether those are politically affiliated or not. I go into a lot more detail about this in my book. Um, I cannot say it enough, uh, start at basic need, and please anchor your feminist consciousness there. 
when you walk into a book club or you're with your women, other women in your family or you're with your friends, the second people start talking about aspirational living, about luxury, about elite, about um, really privatized experiences, that's when I've noticed in my career that the conversation backslides into white feminism very quickly. You lose sight of, again, that basic need that a lot of marginalized genders do not have met in the United States. I would also encourage you to orient yourself against systems rather than individual people. Um, this ties into what I said earlier about you know one rogue white woman on social media just being dumb and you know has like garbage politics. Um, think of the system that facilitates her. That's what you have to orient yourself against. There will be more white feminists like her. There will be, you know, people who have politics you don't agree with or, you know, are misinformed. But when she is proposing the platforms that she is, when she's like girl bossing or whatever it is that she does, orient yourself against that system that encourages her and facilitates her to have that platform. I would also argue a good um, anecdote antidote to white feminism, and I've even used this a lot um, in my book tour, is to support and work with public institutions. Um, I tracked a lot in my book the ways in which white feminism as an ideology and a practice really fused cleanly with private clubs, private spaces, um, elite institutions, um, all these places where, you know, however well-intentioned everyone is, the minute that is a private club, a private event, um, that quickly backslides into white feminism as well. So in any advocacy work that you do, if you're trying to control for white feminism or work around this, I advocate you know, working with institutions like libraries, parks, public schools. These are things that all of our taxes do and should pay for. And allegedly, they are made with all of us in mind. So there's a different barrier for entry if you're trying to get together with other marginalized genders and you all meet at a park as opposed to, you know, a very bougie coffee shop, right? These are smaller things to keep in mind, but that are very important in controlling for white feminism. Um, here are some ways to control for white feminism at work. I know many of you are students, but I would urge you to keep a lot of these tactics in mind for when you do graduate and you do go out into the job market. Um, I have done many of these. I go into detail about them in my book. I think they're very important, particularly as um, a woman like me who's had a lot of seniority in companies and who has been very visible. Um, these are some things that I have tried and have worked. So I would really encourage you to start or work with a union in any job that you take. Um, if it is available, join it. If it's not, start it. Um, I have been privy to a lot in my career, all sorts of conversations around, you know, pay equity for women, particularly women in professional jobs, white collar jobs, corporate jobs. Um, but if you work with a union, it changes the framework of what you're talking about in that you're not advocating for all these sort of like siloed like negotiation tactics and like here's how to ask for a job without you know, challenging the like fragile man who's, you know, hiring you and making him feel insecure or whatever. Um, with a union, you're able to get a floor salary for entry level employees. So instead of relying on this very, you know, I would argue like very classist knowledge about like how to go into a job interview, remember to send thank you cards, you know, that sort of thing. If you work with a union and you work at a union shop, everybody who starts in a certain position starts with a certain salary. Um, depending on how you know senior you care to go and whatever your profession is, please try to manage board expectations. This is easier said than done. I have been in this position. It's very challenging. Um, many of the uh, white women who were famously fired or let go, you know, a couple summers ago, this is a place where they clearly messed up, um, and for reasons that I'm empathetic to. Um, depending on your job experience and what you know, so a board of any company you have, they are the people who make a lot of decisions, you know, regardless of what your position is or, you know, how many followers you have on Instagram or how visible you are. Um, the board literally sees the revenue of the company usually every quarter, sometimes less or more, and makes decisions. Many of those like girl bossy um, ladies who are business owners who are famously fired for, you know, racism and harassment and stuff, 
something they all had in common that I was um, privy to prior to the reports and then the reports made it very clear is that they were in a position where they overpromised things and in doing that, they had to exploit the people they managed. So what I mean when I say that is that, you know, being cis women who were at the head of these companies, they're already at a disadvantage in terms of being seen as, you know, capable, strong, influential, all those things that get conflated with masculinity in a way that's not accurate or true. Um, and so when they are put in these positions, a trend I noticed with a lot of them is that you know, they were put in front of these very aggressive revenue metrics. You will make an absurd amount of money over this amount of time. What that means on the ground, if you are said senior woman, is that that means that you are paying people very poorly. You are not giving people time off, particularly if they are new parents or if they have um, elders in their family who they have to care for or you know, they have a special needs sibling, or they're sick, they have COVID, they need time off. Um, it also means that you know, the healthcare is probably not very good, right? Because all the money goes into profits rather than actually having decent healthcare for the people who do this labor every day. And so where you can to keep board expectations lower, please do that if you're in a position to, because it will directly translate to being able to be more respectful of the people you manage in terms of their time, their money, their ability to work, their ability to be healthy. Something I did a lot in my roles um, is that I was very adamant in proposing policy changes that would outlast me. Um, a lot of you know, privatized work in this country is you know, hire and fire at will. So regardless of what I think, right, as the EIC of Jezebel or the executive editor of Vogue, if I have a policy where you know, I don't think that new mothers should have to come back to the office right away. Um, I'm able to make it work with my team so that they can work from home for a certain amount of days while their body is healing, um, while they're figuring out how to care for a newborn. If I'm fired tomorrow, for whatever reason, um, that can change immediately for the people who work in this company. And so something I was adamant about in my jobs is that regardless of you know, what my politics were, or what I tried to get through, I tried to write policy. <laughs> and I tried to get policies passed so that in the event that I take a new job, I'm fired. Um, the um, way that I'm able to advocate for certain employees, their respect, their rights in the workplace will endure. Um, I think this is particularly important for proposing policy changes, especially for people you will never meet. Um, I tried to think about that a lot as a very senior woman in w women's media in that a sort of tragedy that comes with seniority, I think in a lot of fields, but especially my own, is that you know the higher up you go, the farther you get away from the entry level employees. And they are the ones who actually need the most protection. They are the ones that need the most advocacy in terms of the company not taking advantage of them, not sexually harassing them. Um, not putting too much workload on them and then not compensating them, not having good health care. And yet as a very, very senior person, you are taken farther and farther away from not only their reality, but also their workload, what their day is like. So in a lot of policy that I tried to get through, I always tried to think of the people I would literally never meet. And then something I did a lot that I had a fair amount of success was um, removing resume barriers. I'm sure there's talk about this at Scripps already. If there's not, there should be. Um, something I was across a lot in women's media is um, I would be pulled into these like conference rooms sometimes and you know the feminist identified woman who I worked for would be like Koa you know why don't we have any black women on our team um, and I would say well um, I mean look at the resumes of the people who are in this room with us they all went to elite colleges they all come from middle class homes um, they've all gotten, you know, opportunities at these very particular, you know, elite internships. And when you have that narrow of a um, ideal resume, guess who's walking in the door? White, middle class, cis women. And yet, you know, for higher ups, this is head scratchy. Like, why don't, you know, Latinas and, you know, native people and trans women and, you know, working class and non-binary people, why don't they want to work here? And it's like, because they don't have that resume. So a lot of times what I would do to counter this is that um, in job descriptions that I would write for uh, jobs I was hiring for, I would nix things like college education. 
Um, I would nix things like, you know, an arbitrary number of years of experience. Um, I come from digital media. I don't come from print. So an advantage that gives me is that, you know, three years in a digital newsroom, that's the equivalent to 10 in print. So if you have been, you know, working in some sort of a newsroom capacity for a couple of years, yeah, join my team. It's really hectic. You've probably covered Trump. You know about, you know, the the movements of the pro-life movement. So I think it's important to, um, if you know, you actually want to diversify and actually have different voices, faces, ideologies, however you or the institutions you're thinking of um, present that, the resume is key. And something to also keep in mind is that if you keep this very narrow, tight resume, um, you are ensuring that only a certain type of person walks in the door. Um, this is a quote that I love to close with. Um, Anne Braden is an incredible author and anti-racist activist. I go into a lot of detail about her in my book. Um, she is an anti-racist white woman from the South. Um, I, I go into more detail about them. They are an incredible example, I think, in the United States of um, white women who were not white feminists. <laughs> Um, she has an incredible quote that I quote and that I think about a lot in that she says, in every age, no matter how cruel the oppression carried on by those in power, there have been those who struggled for a different world. I believe this is the genius of humankind, the thing that makes us half divine, the fact that some human beings can envision a world that has never existed. It's just poetic and so perfect, and I encourage you to, in thinking about white feminism and thinking about other movements, you will in your life go up against you know, people, whether they're feminist identified or not, who will say, this is the best we can do. White feminism, I would argue, is a grand um, sort of manifestation of this is the best we can do. This is the best we can do and still make money for companies. This is the best we can do and still have an elite institution. This is the best we can do. And I think this particular quote by Anne Braden and a lot of work that she did in her life underscores that you are not looking for the best you can do. You are literally advocating for something you have never seen. Um, cis white women having the ability to vote in, in the United States. That was completely unheard of 100 years ago. Um, women having access to birth control without the permission of their husbands and fathers, and who knows, that may change now. Um, that was just deemed like so pie in the sky and unrealistic. Um, having weekends prior to labor unions advocating in this country, having a weekend where you do not work, that was considered so outrageous and unheard of. And so in a lot of advocacy you do, and a lot of activism you think about and participate in, please keep Ann Braden's words in mind. You're not looking for what is feasible. You are looking for something that you have never seen, and that's the point. That's all. <laughs>